Welcome back to What Would You Ask podcast. My next guest is the founder of Biagi. You remember that. Come on. His dad was in the business, right? Uh, Rossetti handbags. Come on. You guys got to know that stuff. And he comes in. You're thinking, oh, this guy's just going to have handbag like his dad. Nope. He came in with something. Luggage. It was really cool. I mean, it was, uh, I forgot the name of that. Uh, what was it the zip thing? The little. Uh, zip sack. Zip sack. Yeah. I mean, really cool stuff. Then it folded up. You remember this, right? It's a luggage company featuring revolutionary travel bag that can easily be stored in really, really, really small places, which is really, really cool. Um, you know, come on. And I think that Stephen came up with the idea because he was living in an apartment in New York City and said, uh, you know, <laughs> there's no room here, right? It's a million dollars a foot. What are you going to do? Um, he appeared in the ABC hit show Shark Tank, of course, season six, episode 11. Stephen Hirsch, welcome to What Would You Ask podcast. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Tell us a little bit about the journey. You create this thing. I know your father was involved early. Uh, maybe another partner is what I read as well. And then, you know, some some trials and tribulations. And they say, hey, you know, you're on your own now, kid. And what did you do? You kind of, well, we're going to talk about what you did. You took it to the tank. So tell us a little bit about the creation of the product, one. And then what brought you to the Shark Tank? So I spent 10 years in commercial real estate, and I thought that that was going to be my career. And then in 2008, the uh, market collapsed, the economy crashed, and uh, things obviously weren't going as, as, as planned for me. And there I was still doing it for a couple of years, and, uh, but I was looking for other opportunities. And this, my father's partner, he, like, you, like you said in the, in the introduction, um, they were in the handbag in, um, business for many years. I was not in that business with them. Um, and they decided that they wanted to do something different. Um, I was in the same boat. So together we developed this product. Um, uh, you know, I think you pretty much covered, you know, why we, we found it to be a problem. We're New Yorkers and in New York space is always at a premium. So uh, we started developing it. We saw another bag that was a foldable bag that was doing pretty well out there. But the problem with that bag is that it was a two wheel bag and it didn't have, you know, complete structure. So uh, we thought if we can make a better mousetrap, then we would really have something. So we worked on this product, uh, you know, took several trips out to the Far East, you know, we developed it, we worked on it, we engineered it, um, we, we made samples, and we came up with these bags that basically was a suitcase, just like any suitcase, you're not giving anything up, it had four wheels, it, it had full structure, it had these like wings that came down and a hinge on the bottom, and it was able to fold up so you could slide it, you know, under a bed, for easy storage. And that was the, that was the product. So we went into shark, the, you know, so originally we thought that we were going to, the plan was to go to retail with it, to sell it to Dillard's, to Macy's, to these guys. And my father and his partner had a lot of experience doing that with our handbag business. So we didn't think it would be much of, a, of an issue. We believed in what, what we created and uh, we, we did it. And if you watch the episode, you'll know that that didn't quite work out. And uh, at that point, my father and his partner decided that they're out. Uh, they, 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 weren't, they really didn't un know how else they were going to distribute this product. So if you're not going to sell it successfully in a, with big box retail, then how are you going to do volume and how are you going to create a company that's, that's worth spending your entire day working on? Right. So, yeah. So you get out to Culver City and you've, you, you've made it, you've done through, you've gone through the Bible of paperwork that you have to give to uh, uh, the show to get you on. You've spent your time with the producers that are assigned to you. We know the whole story. You get out there. How are you feeling? Are you feeling like I'm the, you know, I run this thing. I know my business better than these five icons. I get their icons, but I know my business better. Or are you thinking, you know what? I left something at the hotel. Maybe I can grab a cab and run back to the hotel and abort this mission. Tell us a little bit about what you're feeling as they're counting down and the doors are about to open. Uh, from the, from day one, when I, when I, the opportunity presented itself to apply and, you know, get onto the show, I was going on there for one reason and one reason only. And that was to, um, develop a relationship with Lori because as I mentioned before, we were not having success with the product in big box retail because of presentation and, and, and 
um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, merchandising. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I thought the best opportunity was going to be QVC. So one, one goal in mind, and that was to hook Lori, bring her in and, and, and work with her and get, get on QVC. So you come into the tank. I thought you did a great job with your, your, your presentation uh, before Q&A. Um, I'm going to take a few questions from some of the um, listeners. Uh, Mark from Oak Brook, Illinois wants to know, were there key points of your presentation that you felt for, critical that the Sharks understood? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, so, so first of all, I would say the key point that I wanted them to understand is that the product, the reason we're not selling it successfully has nothing to do with the product. It has everything to do with the way we're selling the product and the fact that in a big box retail store, they just put the stuff out there and nobody knows that it folds and nobody knows that it has any point of difference. So I just wanted to them, I wanted them to understand and specifically Lori to understand that we're going to sell this thing. We just have to do it in a different way. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, conversely, um, Ashley from Scottsdale, Arizona is asking, were there weak areas of your business that you thought might be concerning during the Q&A with the, tent, with the sharks? Were there weak areas of the business? Uh, well, I mean, you know, I, th I think the answer, you know, I'm sorry to disappoint, but I think the answer is really the same. When you don't have a track record of, of success, right? So we, we put this out there, we tried to sell it, it didn't work. The, the obvious question that's going to come to an investor's mind is, how do I know? How do I know that, that if we do it a different way, that, that we're not going to, why didn't you try it yourself? Or, or why didn't you try it a different way? Or, or, or maybe you didn't and didn't succeed. They're going to put money into this business. I mean, obviously it's, it's best if they see, you know, there's a lot of different companies that go into Shark Tank, in, into the Shark Tank. Some of them are selling, but they just, you know, and they're growing and their sales are growing and, and, and that, that's a track record. And they, they're just saying, okay, you come into the business and we're going to take this thing to the next level. I wasn't coming in there with that story. I was saying, this is a product that essentially failed right. and I need, I, I'm going to work with you to do it in a different way. It's a bit of a you know, nuanced thing, but it's a tougher sell. It definitely is. And I'm glad you brought that up because I find it interesting that we see, as you know, six or excuse me, eight to 12 minutes is basically what we see. Um, you're in there for what, an hour, maybe more, maybe a little less. Tell us when you, when you went that way. I mean, that's a real commitment to go that way because that is not the template that people are using. But I think it was a very smart decision by you. I really do. I think it was a smart way to go. Was there more discussion around people getting on you about that you know, critical point of failure and then to build it back up? Tell us what we maybe we didn't hear. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um there, there's a lot of a lot that you don't hear when you're watching the show. As, as you said, I was in there for almost an hour and a half. I had a great time with them, all in all. Uh, they, there were skeptics, mm -hmm. um, specifically Mark, Mark Cuban. I could see he was like looking at me a little cross-eyed. Uh, he wasn't sure. You know, like, like, like I mentioned to you before we went on the air, I'm a, I'm a New Yorker. I could, I could talk, you know, I could talk a good game. Yep. I could do that with anybody. Yep. Um, so I think he was like looking at me and thinking, right, what am I dealing with over here? Um, and, uh, and, and all in all, like, like what I told you, the product had failed. We didn't sell it. Skepticism all, all around. Um, I knew going in, my, my entire goal was to get to work with Lori. That was my entire goal. I, I felt that whatever, however I was selling and when I, whatever I was telling them and even however I was answering the skeptics and they did ask me a lot of questions that, that you didn't hear, questions about myself, personal questions about uh, my family or previous business. I guess they wanted to know uh, whether that was going to be an asset for them if they invested. The fact that my family has a very long history of manufacturing bags and selling bags and, and Rossetti was a very successful handbag company. Yep. Uh, we were talking a little bit about the differences between luggage and handbags, of which there are many. Specifically, uh, uh, a luggage is, is more like handbags are something that somebody will buy on an impulse, right? They don't need it today necessarily, but they'll go in, they like it, they like the price, they'll buy it. Yep. Um, luggage is something that somebody buys an on average every six or seven years. It's more like a refrigerator than, than a handbag. So, so we were talking about that, you know, things, things along those lines. 
So let's talk about what the sharks felt at the end when we see it. And, and maybe you can comment. So you mentioned Mark. Mark said that he'd like the product, though. I mean, he was really, you know, he was he likes it. Um, but he just kind of went out. I don't know if there was, I didn't see really a lot of definitive reasons why he went out, but he decided to go out. Robert had a problem with the consumer education issue, you know, about learning about the product. And I think it being more demonstrative or necessary to be, uh, go that way. So he goes out, Kevin thinks the consumer education is an issue too. And, and, you know, he falls out. Then you got Damon, who offered 500 for 33%. Um, and he gives you 20 seconds to decide. Is that now? I mean, that's, yeah. You know, well, let me just say about Mark, just one. Go one ahead. Sure. Mark, please. Funny. Yeah. He asked me, he said, he asked me, are you uh, an NBA fan? So I told him I was. So he said, uh, did you ever hear of a referee? There's a referee apparently. Well, I know, now I know, I didn't know then, but there's a referee named Steve Javi. Yep. He told me that I sound exactly like him and that I remind him of him and he, and he doesn't like him particularly. <laughs> <laughs> so he could never go into business with me. <laughs> oh my God. He, and I think he's from Brooklyn too. Isn't Steve Javi? Mark? I, no, no. Mark's from Pittsburgh, but Javi's from, he's a Brooklyn guy. I think. I think yeah. He, it sounds like one. Yeah, That's <laughs> funny. That is so funny. So when Damon puts that clock on you, I mean, yeah. you've got guys, is that, that kind of pressure, I know you want Lori, but you haven't heard from her yet. So you're probably not going to take the Damon deal. How does that play out? I mean, tell us about that. Right. Uh, that was a little bit of a pressure moment right there. Right. Damon said I have a certain amount of time to decide. And I had no idea if Lori was going to come in. And he and he knew that I didn't know that. So that's why he put the clock on me. Uh, I'd wanted to work with Lori. I would have, if, if, if that didn't happen and I worked with Damon, and again, this is also another thing that made it hard. If I had no interest of wor in working with Damon, I would have turned down his offer and hoped for the best with Lori. But, but uh, that wasn't really the case. I would have worked with Damon, right? Again, if you gave me a choice between everybody up there, it would have been Lori first, Damon second. Because yeah. Damon also comes from the same world, right? right? I yeah. mentioned on the show, we, we, our offices were at the time were right, right next to each other. Um, he worked across the street, I think, in the Empire State Building. I worked across the street from the Empire State Building. I see his car every day. Everybody always said that's the FUBU guy's car. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, they parked the nice cars in the garage. They parked them right up front so everybody could see it, right? It's like yeah. uh, it was a Maybach. <laughs> and uh, everybody, everybody told me that, you know, it was always that's the FUBU guy. So, you, you know, so it was a, it was a, pre it was a pressure moment. Uh, Lori, Lori kind of kind of bailed me out. Um, and Damon then backed out because he thought that, which was great of him, actually. I agree. He, he helped me out. It was really good of him. And it shows a lot about, about his character. Uh, so, yeah. You're we talking about him things. backing out because he felt, because you had said to him that you'd like to get it to be, you know, on TV and to be shown. And he was like, then Laurie is your, your partner, which yeah, that doesn't happen a lot. And I agree with it you. It really doesn't. And he was totally sincere about it. I've actually met him ap after the show. We, we talked about it. And, uh, you know, that's what I, I believed. Uh, he, he saw the same thing and, uh, he did, he did, he did a great thing for me. So you end up with a deal with Lori, the one you went in there for 33%, uh, uh, for 500. She did mention that she was interested in renaming the product. We haven't seen that happen. Um, so did she come off of that, uh, after the show or was that yeah. just a, something she mentioned? She came off of it. Okay. Good. I mean, I love the name. I don't know why we have to change that. Um, Alex from Jupiter, Florida wants to know any funny behind the scenes anecdotes or memorable moments you care to share with us? Yeah, there was a very funny moment that I'd wish they'd aired and I thought for sure they would and was shocked when they didn't. So if you remember on my episode, um, I made a phone call to my father. Yep. In the hallway. Yep. So, right. So, so, so I was talking to him and, and, um, and then I forget who came up, Mr. Wonderful. Mr. Wonderful and I got along great. He kept on calling me Stevie. And he, and he, and, uh, and he, he kept on, I don't know, he kept on telling me, I, I love you, Stevie. I love you, Stevie. He was really nice to me. Everybody says he's such a tough guy, but I found him to be really personable. Anyway, so he came and he started talking to my father also. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, then, and then I think Lori also did and Damon also did. So, yeah, they, they were talking on the phone to my dad and Damon, we know a lot of the same people. Cause like I said, we work in the same area and we, we travel yeah. in the same circles. Yeah. So, so, uh, they were talking about, you know, this guy, do you know, that guy, 
and uh, and it was, it was really funny. I thought part of it, and 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 Lori, Lori, I thought I think Lori told him because we were a family business, and Lori, Lori kept on telling him she wants to be part of our family. <laughs> it was very funny. Um, I thought for sure they'd air some of that. That's cool. That's really cool. That's that's I like that. I wish they did. That would have been cool to see yeah. too. By the way, so tell us you you leave there with Lori. Um, as most people know that. Um, Lori's husband, Dan, is her team lead. Our listeners and viewers are, you know, I've probably got five questions about um, what happens in the due diligence. I know there's some stuff that you can't say and can say, but just tell us what happens when you leave the tank. What sure. do you hear from Dan right away? Is he waiting in your trailer? Or do you wait three months? Tell us about what the due diligence, how it starts. Tell us a little bit about it. So the producer um, took me back to the trailer uh, told me that Lori had um, was going to be in touch with me uh, in a couple in about two weeks, and, and it was almost exactly two weeks later that Lori called me. Uh, she had we had a we had a brief conversation, you know, just pleasantries and everything like that, and you know, got, you know, got to know each other a little bit, and and then she she told me uh, that I was going to hear from. I get. I think it was Dan. I think it was Dan, but but it might have been their their lawyers or accountant or whoever that is. I'm not exactly sure what it. But anyway, so so they sent me a bunch of uh, items, item requests, uh, due diligence requests, uh, financials, and you know all kinds of information that an investor would need before investing in your company. Mm-hmm. A Shark Tank does quite a bit of due diligence on you before you go on, just to make sure you're not totally full of it, but but not the kind of detail that an investor would need. So uh, we went through that process. Um, I sent in everything. They asked me questions whenever they had them. I answered them as best as I could. And uh, then we got on the phone again and, you know, talked talk uh, talk about how to close the deal. That's awesome. That is awesome. Um, so you do close the deal with, with Lori. And by the way, you know, our listeners and viewers know, Stephen, that um, most deals don't close necessarily. First of all, they don't close um, at all, but some deals morph into some other deal, right? They get to there's six months later, my business is better than it was six months ago. And I don't know if I want to give 35% up from the entrepreneur side, the, you know, the, the shark might go into this thing saying, you know, I, I took a flyer on you. And as after the due diligence, I'm a little bit leery. So let's part and shake hands. So the deals, you know, like any other negotiation, they, they still can go South as a handshake deal in the tank. Tell us a little bit about now you're leading up to your airing night. You find out you're airing. Tell us a little bit about that Shark Tank effect once you go on uh, TV and what happened to your website and all that stuff. Now it's different. You're not selling, you know, scrub daddies here. Um, you know, it's a little bit uh, different the product. Um, but tell us your, your how in your business what is that Shark Tank effect like? Right. Um, um, to be perfectly honest with you, it was a little disappointing. Uh, because because the product that I featured on the show was the one that I described to you, um, which was the, the the structured bag with the with the hinge on the bottom. Yep. And Lori actually right, one of the first things Lori told me when we spoke is that she didn't think that that was going to be what she calls my hero. Right. She she th- there was another bag, which you mentioned also at the beginning of the call called the zip sack, which was like a pouch that opens up into kind of like a wheel duffel, like a four wheel yeah. duffel bag. That's cool. Like um, that. The entire time when when I was uh, filming, she was focused on that product and not on the product that I was selling the whole time. <laughs> so so she, she turned out to be 100 percent right about that. And and it was no. The, the starkest, right, where you saw that the clearest was after Shark Tank when I aired and I had all this traffic to my website. And we had looked at that product as kind of an afterthought. And we thought the main event was the one that, right, obviously I spent the most time selling. Uh, we didn't have a ton of inventory in the other one. So now that, you know, that was the first time that I really had, you know, tons of traffic, you know, my website, like that, those kinds of numbers, big numbers. And, uh, and that bag, the one that Lori liked, the Zip Sack, sold out in minutes. I just didn't have a ton of them. The other ones, which I had a lot of, didn't, didn't sell that much of it. I sold some of it, but yeah. I was left over with a lot of it. And I, I thought I would clean it, clean house. That's what I thought would happen, but that's not what happened. Had I had more zip sacks, I would have cleaned the house. So tell us how the business is today. How are things going? How has it evolved since Shark Tank? Tell us what's going on. The business today is a completely different business than what it was before I went on Shark Tank. I did QVC with Lori for a while. Mm-hmm. We did very well. Uh, um, it played itself out. And uh, made, the main reason I stopped doing QVC was because 
Uh, I was learning e-commerce the entire time. I was learning other ways to, to sell my product. And I, I, I became pretty proficient at digital marketing and uh, content creation. You know, we made some videos that, that have gotten like tens of millions of views and, and that have made us a lot of money. And uh, I, um, I decided that, and you know, Lori is on board with it completely, that we decided that, you know, better that this should be an e-commerce business completely. And QVC didn't really go hand in hand with that. So today we're, we're basically an e-commerce company and the entire business is predicated on, on uh, our ads and our media buys. And it's, it's, like, it's like a completely different animal from, from what it was before. I, have, I spend zero time trying to get, get into retail doors, talking to buyers. That's yeah. what it is. It seems like, Stephen, the product, I was on the website last night. Um, by the way, folks, it's biagi.com, B-I-A-G-G-I.com. Um, I saw carry-ons and trolley bags and you got a bunch of accessories on there. The website, by the way, is is really cool. Um, right. Tell me about the Zip Sack Boost. What What is that? Is that that's the Zip Bread Sack? and butter. Yeah, that's a, that's a, um, so the Zip Sack is a, it's like a patented item. It's a, it's a pouch that, that's, that you unzip it. It's, it's like, looks like a closed pouch. You unzip the pouch and then you fold the fabric over the wheels and then you zip up the base to the, to, to the other side of it. And then you have a, a, a full duffel. Now we make those in different sizes. We have large ones, carry on ones. And, and, uh, and like I said before, we're a digital marketing company right now, basically, and yeah. a content creation company. So, you know, the more features you have, the better video you have and the more attention you get when you're advertising on Facebook. So the ZipSack Boost is a ZipSack. We made a wraparound zipper on the bottom so that the bag could expand. So uh, so it's uh, we have two of them actually now. One of them starts off as a small, like under seat size carry on. You unzip it on the bottom and it becomes bigger and becomes a full size carry on. And the other one is a full size carry on that you make you could turn into a check-in bag. So you know, just another feature. Yeah. I have, was on looking at this in my you know, office uh, last night. My wife came in and she was like, what are you looking at for, you know, for <laughs> Christmas gifts for me? And I'm like, no, but check this out because we have four kids and they all do something, right? My boys are in travel baseball and, you know, now in the COVID environment, we're not doing much traveling for baseball. Anyway, the season, the summer was very sporadic, but we always are looking for the right size bag, right? And one, because we're going from hotel to hotel and sometimes we're moving to different hotels based on the tournament we go to, um, having uh, one that breaks down um, is definitely key, right? And so right. there is definitely all different sizes. I saw 50% off signs. I don't know what that means, but I did see 50% off all bags on there. So I can tell you, I'll be coming back to the website and I encourage others to do the same. Wait a week. Wait, Wait a week. week. Yeah, well, well, we've been on. I mean, the the travel goods business has not exactly uh, been uh, been doing that that well. I, since yeah, I imagine. Yeah. Uh, so it's been a very rough time. I mean, but but, but we're okay. I mean, we're surviving. Yeah. We're still profitable, weirdly yeah. enough, and uh, we're still selling. We're, it's just not anywhere near where it was before COVID. So we've been on sale. We've been discounting and doing whatever we have to do to get to get goods out the door and and turn over turn over inventory and and. Uh, Black Friday. I mean, Black Friday is obviously going to be our best deal. Absolutely. We'll wait yeah. for that. Stephen, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for taking us through the journey and the stories. It's been fun. We wish you the best. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll be back with more What Would You Ask podcast in a second.